Hare Krishna. So in anticipation of the upcoming festival of Ram Navami, in today's Shravanadijal program, I was asked to speak something about Lord Ram. Lord Ram is of course most popular, loved and highly regarded amongst all followers of Vedic culture. Even those who are not followers have heard about him, have heard about the Ramayan. The Ramayan is a very exceptional book of 24,000 verses. And the Ramayan has many, many versions, many editions in different countries. In India itself, you will find many versions of the Ramayana in various languages, each with their own distinct flavor. And one also finds Ramayana in various parts of Southeast and Far East Asia. Until today, the culture of Lord Ram is existing, even in those countries which are probably theocracies. Theocracies means that they are run by, on, on the basis of some religion, not um, for followers of Lord Ram. For example, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Philippines, it's not a theocracy, but uh, you will find remnants or indications of Lord Ram, even in Korea, in Japan, in China, in Cambodia, and all those places, what to speak of Sri Lanka and others that are closer to India. Till recently, till a few centuries ago, there was a dynasty of kings in Thailand who were named after Ram. Ram 1, Ram 2, Ram 3, and they had a series of kings. They have many versions of their Ramayana called Ramikin and so on. So undoubtedly one of the most popular, one of the most well-known personalities. Now, God is a very mysterious subject because unless we understand from the proper sources, we will either think that the descriptions of God are imaginary. We will, for example, think that Lord Ram is a mythological personality, that Ramayana is all mythology. Or we may think that he was just a human being, even if he was um, a, you know, a historical character. You see, human beings who do not have proper spiritual understanding are liable to make two kinds of important mistakes. One is to imagine that the human being is God. Have you met people like that? The philosophy is that we are all God. It's just that we have forgotten it. So, the process of trying to understand spiritual knowledge is to remove our ignorance and then we realize that actually I am God. But the fact is that we are not God. There's no vacancy there. The post is filled up. It's not even a post actually, because a post <coughs> implies that it can be attained by anybody, subject to certain qualifications. For example, a prime minister, or a king, or let's say a professor in a college, or anything, any post in this world can be obtained if you have certain qualifications. But God is not a post. God is an eternal personality, eternally existing person. God was, always was God and always will be God. And those who are not God will never be God. They were not God, they are not God, and they will not be God. So this is the first major mistake people make, that they think that ordinary humans are God. We are all God. But the fact of the matter is, we are not God, we are gods. An apostrophe mark after the D which means we are the property of God. We are the devotees of God. 
The second mistake that people make is to think that God is an ordinary human being. The first mistake was to think that human beings are God and the second is to think that God is a human being. And especially in the case of Lord Ram and Lord Krishna, this mistake is especially prevalent. You see, when the Lord descends into this material world, <coughs> He does so from the spiritual world, from His kingdom, from His abode. And God is neither human nor anything. He, he, he resides in His own resplendent spiritual glory in the spiritual world. But when He descends in different species, He acts just like a member of that species. So when he came as Matsya Avatar, he would swim like a fish. When he came as Kurma Avatar, he would act like a turtle or a tortoise. When he came as Narasimha, half man and half lion, then he, <coughs> he would roar like a lion. Similarly, when he descended in the human species, he acted like a human being. So because he acted like a human being, people who are not trained in spiritual understanding in the proper discipline succession think that he is an ordinary human being. Even if he did exist, he is just a human being, maybe an extraordinary human being, but a human being nevertheless. But that is not the case. Lord Ram descended into this world to establish what a perfect human being should be. And therefore, he acted like a human being. You see, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, can manifest many moods. We can also do that as individuals. And we behave differently in different circumstances. Sometimes, for example, we may be angry. Sometimes we are happy. Sometimes we smile. Sometimes we are very grave and serious. So we all have these moods. And we also go to different places and we behave differently in different places. When we come to the temple, we dress in a certain way, we behave in a certain way, we come with a certain mindset. When we go to the cinema, I hope you don't, but I'm just giving an example. <laughs> When you go to the cinema or you go to some other, let's say a sporting arena, then you go in a different mindset, you go with different clothes. You go to your place of work, your mindset is again different, your clothes are different. So similarly, the original Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna manifests innumerable expansions of Himself. And these expansions named Ram, Narsimha, Vamana, etc., they advent themselves into this world from time to time. And what makes, what is the distinction between each of these forms? They're actually all the same as Lord Krishna. They're identical to Krishna. Just as the happy you is the same as the angry you or the cheerful you, or the upset you. It's all you. It's you who have different moods. So imagine that you could manifest these personalities according to your mood. So let's say when you're angry, you suddenly had an angry you emerging from you. And then you had, let's say, a very brave you. You were in some chivalrous act. Then you had a brave you. You had an official you who lives in the office and you expanded yourself into all these personalities who are all you, but each of them is exhibiting a certain mood, a certain mentality and a certain appearance. Just like you dress differently in all these different cases. So similarly, Krishna manifests himself as all these different personalities, Ram, Narsim, etc. Each of them have a different appearance and each of them has a different mood and they come for specific purposes. Each of them has an agenda and they fulfill their agenda and then go back to the spiritual world. So therefore, when Lord Krishna comes as Lord Ram, 
He wants to exhibit to the world how an ideal, moral human being should be. So he is popularly known as Maryada Purushottam. Maryada means one who follows certain etiquette. Purushottam indicates the Supreme Person. So Lord Ram's behavior was ideal in every way. The very beginning of the Ramayana, and we won't go into detail in this now, begins with Valmiki Muni thinking about a question of who the ideal human being could be. <clears throat> and when Narad Muni arrives, he asks him, about the ideal human being and what kind of characteristics an ideal human being should have and is there such a person existing? And then Narad Muni says, yes, indeed, all the qualities that you have mentioned can be found in one person and that is Ram. He is the son of King Dasharath and he exemplifies and embodies all these extraordinary qualities and more. So in that section, in the very beginning of Valmiki's Ramayana, which is the original Ramayana, the Adi Ramayana, and all other Ramayans are based on this one Ramayana, actually. <clears throat> so, in this section of the Ramayana, we find a description of the sublime qualities of Lord Ram. What an ideal human being should be. Because Vyasa the Valmiki's question was very important. Who or what is an ideal human being? <clears throat> what kind of qualities should one have to be an ideal human? <clears throat> Maybe one should be very wealthy, one should be good at football, one should be what? What should one be? These are questions that we ask. So this is answered by Valmiki right in the beginning. <clears throat> And then he says, so I, he wants to know about Ram. And then Valmiki sits in meditation. Of course, it's a long story. It's a beautiful story. And ultimately, at the end of the meditation, Brahma, the creator, appears to him. And he says, I, this whole drama that you saw this bird uh, who was shot down by the hunter, and then in great angst, in anger, you curse the hunter. Because this couple, the bird couple, were engaged together. And then you shot them. You were so cruel. So Valmiki's compassionate heart uh, burst forth uh, into a stanza, into a verse, which is called a shloka. So the word shloka, you've all heard of that. That comes from the Rama. And it came forth that particular meter of composition just spontaneously came forth from Valmiki's mouth. Even he was surprised. What is it that I just uttered? And his disciples immediately committed that verse to memory. And then Valmiki was thinking, what on earth happened to me? Why did that come out of my mouth? How many of us have experienced that something comes out of our mouth and then we wonder, what happened? Why did I say that? We all experience that. We say something and then, oh, oh, what did I say? And sometimes it just comes out of our mouth, yes? So, but this, but Valmiki was not an ordinary person. Therefore, when something comes out of the mouth of an extraordinary personality like Valmiki, it's something special. So the disciples knew the glories of their Guru. So they knew there was something here. Something was about to happen. This one verse was glorious. He had cursed this hunter, Valmiki. Because you have destroyed the happiness of this innocent bird couple. May you live eons and eons in misery. A saintly person generally doesn't curse like that. But this came out and he was also surprised. Why did I curse like this? Why did I uh, succumb to anger in this way? And as he was deliberating on this, the creator of the universe, Brahma, descended into the ashram of Valmiki. And he said to Valmiki, my dear sage, please do not fret and please do not be anxious about this. It is I 
who actually inspired you to speak this verse. Because I have a plan for you. And the plan is that you have to write the story of Ram. At that time, it appears that Ram, when the time when Valmiki Muni wrote the Ramayana, Ram was there. It was at some point, just before um, Lord Ram's departure for Ayodhya, it is at some point there that uh, Valmiki Muni started writing down the Ram, not writing down in those days, there was no, he just composed it and remembered it. And much of the Ramayan is in the future tense, in the sense that it's something that happened after Valmiki composed the Ramayan. So how did that happen? Brahma spoke to um, Valmiki and said, by my empowerment, you will be able to visualize every single detail of the pastimes of Lord Ram, all his activities and who said what. You will see it crystal clear as if it's happening in front of your eyes. Like today, we can see things on television. Something may be happening far away in the other corner of the globe, but we can have a live telecast and see it right in front of our eyes. So there was subtle technology there, subtle technology based on spiritual prowess, based on mystic potency that was there for great personalities like Brahma, Narada, Valmiki, Vyasadeva, etc. So not only did they themselves have this power, but they could bestow this power upon others on whom they gave their mercy. So Brahma said to Valmiki, that you will be able to visualize every detail of Lord Ram's pastimes, all that has happened so far, all that is happening currently, and all that will happen in the future. And remember, everything you speak, because it will come from inspiration from me, it will be true. Nothing that you write will be false. So this was Brahma's personal assurance that whatever came out of Valmiki's uh, thought, his meditative process, would be the truth. Now we can't say that about ourselves. We may imagine so many things and more often than not we are wrong. But for sages like Valmiki, for Vyasadeva, who compile great scriptures like the Ramayana and the uh, Puranas and Upanishads and so on, they actually visualize these things. They are given internal realization of these facts and these incidents and therefore they're able to uh, relate it as if they were seeing it in front of their eyes. They were, but in front of their internal eyes, not their external eyes. The internal world is a very mystical world. And most people in the current age have no knowledge of that internal world. We are too conscious of the external world. We are so busy with the external world, so engrossed in it. There's so much propaganda about it. And our senses are also so preoccupied with it that we have no inkling that there is a whole universe that resides within us. <coughs> And in the same way that we can visualize things with our external eyes in this external world, in more dramatic and mysterious ways, we can realize things from within, just like Valmiki did. Just imagine, Valmiki was able to visualize the entire Ramayana. All the incidents that is mentioned there, including the conversations, the facial expressions, the features of every individual, the little incidents that happened, everything was visualized by Valmiki crystal clear. And Brahma went on to say that not only will everything you speak or compose be true and nothing you compose will be false, but also your composition will live on this earth as long as there are rivers and mountains and oceans here. 
and the glories of Lord Ram as related by you will be sung even in the higher planets of this universe. So Lord Brahma bestowed such glory on Valmiki. Today we all know of Valmiki as the one who composed this great epic Ramayana. So he, he wrote this and in his meditation and he also himself plays a role in the Ramayana because as we read in the Srimad Bhagavatam and also in a certain section of the Ramayana it is Valmiki in whose ashram Sita Devi takes shelter when she is pregnant and when she is asked to leave the kingdom Valmiki gives her shelter just as Narad Muni gave shelter to the mother of Prahlad when the demigods attacked with the hope that they would kill Hiranyakashipu, they took advantage of Hiranyakashipu's absence to try to kill his unborn son. So Narad Muni had given protection to Prahlad's mother. So similarly here Valmiki had given protection to Sita Devi and Sita and Ram's two sons, Lava and Kush, were born in Valmiki Muni's ashram. So in any case, as Valmiki Muni narrates this, he goes on to, to narrate the whole story leading up to the victory of Lord Ram over Ravana and then the journey back from Lanka to Ayodhya on the Pushpak aeroplane in which the entire army of bears and monkeys were accommodated. There wasn't any problem of reservation and waiting list mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't any issue of flights kind of going down because of some technical error or something like that. It was perfect. Subtle technologies of the past were very, very significantly great compared to today. So they came back. So as Lord Ram was coming to Ayodhya in the Pushpak, Hanuman, he, he landed at some distance. Even before that, he sent Hanuman to inform Bharat about his impending arrival. And he told Hanuman, Hanuman, I would like you to go and break the news of my impending arrival to my brother Bharat, but very carefully examine his facial expressions and his words when you break the news to him. And I want you to tell me exactly what his facial expressions were. How did he react when he heard that I was about to come? I was only a short distance away. Because as we all know, Bharat was the next in line to the throne. And by the conspiracy and the deceptions of Kaikeyi, Ram was sent into exile for 14 years and then the next in line was Bharat. His mother Kaikeyi wanted him to be the king but Bharat was aghast and he was furious with his mother and he refused to sit on the throne. He went to Chitrakoot and then he pleaded with Ram to return and rule over the kingdom. But Ram said, no, that is not possible because I have to follow dharma. So he gave good advice, he gave his blessings and good wishes and affection to Bharat and said, go back Bharat and rule. And Bharat said, no, you are the only king of Ayodhya. I will rule on your behalf as your representative. So he begged Lord Ram's footwear his sandals from him and he took that and he placed it on the throne of Ayodhya and he would worship that and he would take decisions on behalf of those uh, of that set of footwear meaning Lord Ram and he resided at a place that was some distance from Ayodhya that was called Nandi Gram and because Lord Ram was in the forest and he was wearing matted locks of hair and had tree bark as his clothing so Bharat also lived like that and he would live on very meager food 
just have some chickpea flour maybe with some cow urine or he would practically be fasting a very austere life and he was only waiting for the day when Lord Ram would return. Such was the love that Bharat and his other brothers had for Lord Ram. Indeed, this was exactly the love that all the residents of Ayodhya had for Lord Ram. So Bharat was joyous. He became extraordinarily happy to see this, to hear this news from Hanuman. But then suddenly his expression changed because as they were waiting and Hanuman had said that Lord Ram will come right away and Ram's intention in telling Hanuman to watch the facial expressions of, Hanu of Bharat carefully was that in case Hanuman who was very sharp and intelligent detected some regret or some sadness in Bharat's face, then he would understand that Bharat wants to be king and that he's not happy that Lord Ram is coming back. But Hanuman could not uh, uh, trace even uh, an atomic uh, degree of regret in Bharat's face. He understood that Bharat was completely joyful. He was sincere. But then, as they were waiting, and waiting, there was no sign of Lord Ram's Pushpak Viman, the aircraft coming in. Then Bharat started getting suspicious. He said, I'm trusting you, but you know monkeys are hard to trust. <laughs> monkeys are not reliable. They say one thing now and you never know whether you can believe them or not. And Hanuman was offended. You know, he said, you don't think I'm an ordinary, I'm a devotee of Lord Ram, you can't say that to me. So, he was maybe thinking like that. <laughs> and there in the distance, they could see the Pushpak Viman coming in. And that's when he said, yeah, there, there, there is Lord Ram coming. And there were shouts of jubilation. And all the residents of Ayodhya came forth jubilantly to receive Lord Ram. And then Lord Ram arrived and he was accorded the uh, appropriate welcome and greeting uh, by everyone, by appropriate, I mean according to age, according to status, according to relationship. You know, his mothers embraced him, he, he touched their feet. The elders also blessed him, he touched their feet. The others offered their obeisances to him. So everyone interacted differently with Lord Ram, but the foundation of everyone's relationship with Lord Ram was based on love. They really loved Lord Ram and they wanted him to be the king. So in any case, Lord Ram was then coronated as king. A grand ceremony took place. And then after that, Lord Ram ruled. For how many years does anyone know? How many years long was Lord Ram's reign? Yes, 11,000 years. And how old was Ram when he went into the forest in exile? Quiz. <laughs> he was 27 years old. How many years did he remain outside of Ayodhya? 14. 14. So how old was he when he returned and became king? 41. 41. So 41 plus 11,000. Okay, doesn't make much of a difference. <laughs> So Valmiki says he ruled for 10,000 plus 1,000 years, 11,000 years. So 11,000 years is a long time, yes? But for Treta Yuga, it was not a long time. And that reign is considered the ideal reign of any king. And what is it popularly called, the reign of Lord Ram? Ram Rajya. Rajya means the reign. The reign of Lord Ram or Ram Rajya. It's a kind of people today who don't have faith in the scripture of Ramayan. They feel this is just a mythological thing and this is just some kind of a utopian uh, you know, vision that is given out to uh, mollify the people of this world. But actually it is a fact. 
Lord Ram is a historical person. He's the Supreme Lord. Ram Raja happened. But way back in Treta Yuga. So in every respect, this uh, reign of Lord Ram was exemplary. It was ideal. There are many descriptions in Valmiki Ramayana and also in the Puranas. I will recite some of the verses from the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam which in brief describes the reign of Lord Ram or what happened in Ram Rajya. Today whenever we are looking for an ideal world on earth, an ideal life, we always say we want Ram Rajya. So the politicians are always promising us Ram Rajya or uh, the local equivalent of that. They may not use the word Ram Rajya, but they all say they promise you the earth and they say we will give you this and we will give you that. I'm coming from India just, just a few days ago and there there's no limit to the promises that are being made. All kinds of utopias are being presented before the people. We'll do this for you, we'll do that for you. Everyone is presenting dreams, utopian life. So they're looking for Ram Rajya, an ideal world. So what exactly did happen in Lord Ram's time? So let us see. So this is the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 10, which is called the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra. And this is towards the end of the chapter. To save time, I will not read the Sanskrit verses. I'll just read the translation. <coughs> by Srila Prabhupada. Text 50 Being pleased by the full surrender and submission of Lord Bharat, Lord Ramachandra then accepted the throne of the state. He cared for the citizens exactly like a father and the citizens being fully engaged in their occupational duties of Varna and Ashram accepted him as their father. So, as Maryada Purushottam, as an ideal human being, he also was the king. So, he also demonstrated what an ideal king or a political leader or a head of state should be like. The kind of nobility, the kind of virtue, the kind of qualities he had were remarkable. So, here we see an important um, characteristic of Ram Rajya that everybody considered Ram to be like their father. Like children depend on their father or the mother, the praja or the citizens of the kingdom of Lord Ram, they looked up to Lord Ram as a father and the same affectionate exchange that happens between parents and children also happened there. Of course, many of the citizens were perhaps senior to Lord Ram in age Many of them were sages, perhaps. But nevertheless, it was the duty of a king to protect all the citizens and keep them happy in every respect. It is the duty of the head of state to see that the citizens are well fed, that they have shelter, that they are looked after properly, they are protected in every respect, physically and very importantly, even in terms of dharma. So, protecting dharma was an important uh, attribute or a duty of the king. So, uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam elsewhere, there is a beautiful verse that talks about how a king should be vis-a-vis -vis his citizens. Toka nam pitaro bandhu drishaha pakshma striha patihi Patihi prajanam bhikshunam grihi agnyanam buddha surit. So the king is supposed to be a protector of the praja, of the citizens, patihi prajanam, just as tokanam pitaro bandhu, just as the parents are the protectors and the friends of the children, just as the eyelids are protectors for the eye, drishaha pakshma. Striha Patihi, just as the husband is supposed to protect the wife in all circumstances. Bhikshunam Grihi, just like the householders are meant to protect and feed the mendicants. 
Agnanam Buddha, just like those who are intelligent are meant to protect and be merciful to those who are foolish. In the same way, the ideal king should look after his subjects like that and protect them and keep them sheltered and secure and happy in every respect. So this was what happened between the, rela the relationship between Lord Ram and his citizens. Srila Prabhupada mentions in the purport that people are very fond of, law, of the pattern of Ram Rajya. <clears throat> and even today, politicians sometimes form a party called Ram Rajya. But unfortunately, they have no obedience to Lord Ram. It is sometimes said that people want the kingdom of God without God. Such an aspiration, however, is never to be fulfilled. Good government can exist when the relationship between the citizens and the government is like that exemplified by Lord Ramachandra and his citizens. Lord Ramachandra ruled his kingdom exactly as a father takes care of his children and the citizens being obliged to the good government of Lord Ramachandra accepted the Lord as their father. So this is a lesson for all political leaders and also for all citizens. In the next verse, Shukadev Goswami explains, Lord Ramachandra became the king during Treta Yuga. But because of his good government, the age was like Satya Yuga. Everyone was religious and completely happy. So as we all know, there are four ages, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dvapar Yuga and Kali Yuga. And progressively, we move down the four ages and everything that is good diminishes with time. Everything that is bad increases progressively with time. From the beginning of Satya Yuga till the end of Kali Yuga. At the end of Kali Yuga, things are so horrendous that there is no other recourse but for the Lord to descend in an avatar. So he will come at the end of Kali Yuga as Kalki avatar 400,000 years from now. And he will destroy all the miscreants personally and establish dharma and bring in the new Satya Yuga that is to come after this Kali Yuga. So whether it is intelligence, whether it is strength or virtue or good qualities, qualities of love, friendship, valor, dharma, everything diminishes as the ages progress. So there is a progressive lack of trust and even a sense of uh, hatred that the citizens keep for uh, the governments nowadays. We find in every country, almost after one rule there, after the elections come, they change. You have another government and another government. Because in this age, it is very, very hard to satisfy people. And also the leaders aren't of that caliber. They do not have that capacity to satisfy and take care of the praja. In Treta Yuga in Lord Ram's time, they were so devoted to Lord Ram that they could not imagine their life without Lord Ram. Srila Prabhupada narrates the pastime from one, one of the Ramayans about a Brahmana who lived in Ayodhya. And he made a vow that he would never eat his meals in any given day until he had had darshan of Lord Ram. So he would personally go to Lord Ram's palace and the king would give audience to anyone from the citizens who wanted to come in. So he would have darshan of Lord Ram and then go back home and have his meals. It so happened that Lord Ram one time went away for some work from Ayodhya for several days. And because this Brahmana, who was greatly devoted to Lord Ram, did not or could not have darshan of Lord Ram, he fasted. And when Lord Ram returned, he was informed about this Brahmana who had been fasting. Lord Ram was so touched that he 
gave a deity of himself to the Brahmana. He said, this deity of mine is not different from me. So when this deity is with you, it means I am with you. So even if I leave the capital and go somewhere else on some business, please know that I will be with you in the form of this deity. So no more fasting <laughs> when I go out of the capital. So the Brahmana was extremely happy. This deity is still existing today. So in any case, such was the relationship, such was the love that existed between the citizens and the king. And Lord Ram's time was the Treta Yuga. The four ages are sometimes compared to the four metals, gold, silver, copper and iron. So Satya Yuga is called the Golden Age. Treta Yuga is called the Silver Age. Dwapar Yuga is called the Copper Age. And you guessed it, Kali Yuga is called the Iron Age. Not the stainless steel age or the plastic age, it's called the Iron Age. Because iron is the basis of, of these metals. Because iron rusts. Gold is considered the best metal because it retains its excellence. You know, even after years and years, the atmosphere and moisture and this and that cannot affect gold. And that's why it used to be a medium of currency also, years ago. So in any case, the qualities of each age are like that. So Lord Ramachandra lived in Treta Yuga, when people were huge compared to today. Today, perhaps a person who's six and a half feet tall may be considered, or as, say these basketball players are like six, seven, six, eight, six, ten in height, and we may consider them very tall. But by reckoning of the previous ages, they were probably like pygmies or something. <laughs> people were huge, everything was big. Intelligence was superior, bodily size, bodily strength, you know, virtue, friendship, everything was superior. And as Kali Yuga goes on, a time will come, Srila Prabhupada says in one lecture, that by the end of Kali Yuga, people will become like dwarfs. And even a dwarf will be considered a very tall person. And the lifespans of people will diminish. And a person who is 25 years old will be considered a grand old person. So today we still have examples of a few people who live up to 100, or maybe a little more. Mostly people don't live up to that age. And, but as Kali Yuga goes on, the average age is going to drastically drop. And people's bodies and everything will degrade in such a way that they would be pr practically unrecognizable. So this was in Treta Yuga, so we should keep that in mind. Further, Shukadev Goswami says, Lord Ramachandra took a vow to accept only one wife and have no connection with any other women. He was a saintly king and everything in his character was good, untinged by qualities like anger. He taught good behavior for everyone especially for householders in terms of Varnashrama Dharma. He taught the general public by his personal activities. This is called an Acharya. Acharya is one who teaches by personal example. One cannot expect others to follow what one advises them unless one is oneself practicing that. So one has to practice what one preaches. So Lord Ram was exemplary because he actually did everything that he said. He wasn't simply speaking. He lived, he walked his talk, to use uh, today's terminology. And by the way, it's a good idea to go on the Bhagavad Gita walk because you can walk your talk, yes? Yeah. You all know of the Bhagavad Gita walk? Yes. You go around and see all those verses. So we are talking Bhagavad Gita, so now we should walk our talk and go on that walk and good for the body, good for the soul. 
So anyway, Lord Ram was perfect in his behavior, ideal in every respect. He had only one wife. Prabhupada explains, even though his father had many queens, but Lord Ram decided to set an example for people of all ages to come. He accepted only one wife and remained faithful to her despite all sorts of challenges. Prabhupada says that after Sita was kidnapped, he could have also married so many other queens, but he didn't do that. And even after Sita went away to Valmiki Muni's ashram, even then Lord Ram did not marry again. And whenever there was a need for performing some sacrifices, some yagyas and doing other religious performances, where a householder is supposed to have his wife next to him because she is the ardhangini, the equal participant in those ceremonies, he made golden statues of Sita. And each time he had to make a new one, so there were many, many golden Sitas like this. So he remained faithful to Sita all his life. And as did Sita, she remained faithful to Lord Ram. And we know about the tests that she had to undergo. And also, Shukadev Goswami says that everything in his character was good, untinged by qualities like anger. Only on very rare occasions, in very extraordinary situations, would Lord Ram display anger. Can anyone mention any incidents when Lord Ram displayed his anger? While building the bridge to Lanka, well, what happened at that time? Who was he angry with? To the sea god, yes, because he expected the sea god to come up and he wanted to build a bridge across the ocean, but the sea god didn't come. And Lord Ram became furious. And then he drew his bow and he was going to shoot. But then at, at that time, in panic-stricken state, the, the demigod in charge of the ocean, he appeared and he prayed to Lord Ram. And Lord Ram, also being an ideal Kshatriya, had to forgive and give shelter to one who had taken, who had surrendered to him. So this is one of the characteristics of the Lord. So now that he had drawn the weapon, now it had to be shot. And he couldn't shoot it in the ocean, so he had to shoot it somewhere. So then he was advised to shoot it at a particular place. And it is said that that place became a desert. But it was also blessed that that place would become excellent for cows. And that part in Rajasthan and Gujarat in modern day northwestern India is known for exceptional breeds of cows. Hmm? You have many, many excellent breeds there. So that was one occasion when Lord Ram got angry, but those are very, very extreme situations and that was meant for the welfare of the demigod of the ocean. Sometimes a superior for the welfare of the subordinate has to display some anger. But otherwise, in his character, there were no flaws. Even in his speech, he would always be courteous. I often like to narrate this example of Lord Ram's speech. Valmiki or Narad Muni explains, uh, rather Valmiki explains, that Lord Ram's speech was so exemplary that he was Madhura Bhash, Madhura Bhashi, which means his speech was very sweet. He was Mridu Bhashi. He was soft spoken. He wouldn't shout. He wouldn't raise his voice at anyone. He was Purva Bhashi. He would be the one to speak first. You know, sometimes we may meet someone, we may see somebody and think, well, why should I take the initiative and start the conversation? Let the other person start and say, Hari Bol, how are you? And then I'll go and say, okay, Hare Krishna. You know, sometimes the ego comes up a little bit like that. But Lord Ram 
No. He would go up to everybody and ask them. He was very friendly, very humble. Whether he was an ordinary person or a king or anyone, he would go up to them and talk nicely to them. So he was Purva Bhashi. Another thing Valmiki Muni says is that even if somebody spoke to him harshly in a raised voice, Lord Ram would never respond harshly and he would never raise his voice even if the other person raised his voice against him. So these are just some of his qualities pertaining to speech and innumerable other qualities which he exemplified just endeared him to the hearts of all his citizens. And even his devotees today will look on Lord Ram as the ideal person. <clears throat> we worship him because of these ideal characteristics. So, in this way, <coughs> Lord Ram uh, continued his, his uh, reign. But there's some other things, I skipped a page actually. Shukadev Goswami says, O Maharaj Parikshit, best of the Bharata dynasty, during the reign of Lord Ramachandra, the forests, the rivers, the hills and the mountains, the states, the seven islands and the seven seas were all favorable in supplying the necessities of life for all living beings. Which means nature bountifully supplied everything that was required by those residing here, whether animals or humans or anyone. There wasn't any shortage. There wasn't any environmental crisis. Because people knew how to live in harmony with Lord Ram's will. Imejana padasvridha supakvausha divirutha vanadri nadyudan manto hedanta tava vikshitaihi uh, Queen Kunti prays to Krishna that, my dear Krishna, by your glance, tava vikshitaihi. Look, all these trees have become full of fruits and flowers. All the mountains have become full of minerals. All the rivers also have become full of water and they fertilize the soil on the banks with these uh, minerals, the, the silt which has minerals. The oceans are full of pearls. You know, the cities, the villages, the towns are all flourishing. So everything, nature was at her resplendent best. And why was that? Because of Lord Krishna's merciful glance upon them. This is how Kunti Maharani prays in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Similarly here, Shukadev Goswami says uh, about Lord Ram, that in his reign, the natural sources of opulence supplied everything necessary for human beings. Srila Prabhupada says in his purports in the first canto that human prosperity depends on the gifts of nature and not on gigantic industrial enterprises. It's one sentence which I remember struck me very deeply and therefore I have memorized it. It's one of those things he didn't forget. Human prosperity depends on the gifts of nature and not on gi gigantic industrial enterprises. We have a very false and distorted sense of human prosperity. We think of prosperity in terms of having lots of cars and having fashionable clothes and, and things like that. Or having a high GDP. But human prosperity is being able to live in harmony with nature, eating good, healthy food, eat, drinking fresh milk, fresh water, breathing fresh, pure air, having loving relationships with everybody, having no shortage of anything that was good and required in life. Today we seem to be having more and more of material possessions, but we seem to be a very unhappy world. Everywhere the incidence of psychological problems, psychiatric problems, depression and so many other things are growing. Relationship problems galore. 
No two people seem to be getting along for any length of time. Despite all the advancement, all the prosperity. But in Lord Ram's time, there was opulence, yes. Nature provided everything, bountifully. Because nature was so happy that she just gave. Hmm? You know, just like when someone is so happy in devotional service, they just give their money in charity for the Lord. So Mother Earth was also profusely giving everything that her children, the residents of the earth, needed. And that was because of Lord Ram's glance upon her. And then finally, Shukadev Goswami says, when Lord Ramachandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was the king of this world, all bodily and mental suffering, disease, old age, bereavement, lamentation, distress, fear and fatigue were completely absent. And please note this, there was even no death for those who did not want it. And Prabhupada says, please hear carefully, a similar situation could be introduced immediately, even in this age of Kali, the worst of all ages. It is said, Kali Kale Nama Rupe Krishna Avatar. Krishna descends in this Kali Yuga in the form of his holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. If we chant offenselessly, Rama and Krishna are still present in this age. So if we want to introduce Ram Rajya in this age, then we have to chant Lord Ram's names, Lord Krishna's names. So there was even no death for those who did not want it. So what happened to them then? You see, at the end of 11,000 years, after Lord Ra Ram's, uh, Ram had ruled for 11,000 years, a messenger came from Brahma mysterious messenger and he came and gave a message to Lord Ram a coded message cryptic message but Lord Ram understood the message was from Lord Brahma my dear Lord we demigods had petitioned you to to descend on the world to establish Dharma to protect the devotees and to vanquish the miscreants you have accomplished your mission you have lived here and ruled over the world for 11,000 years. Now the time has come for you to return to your abode. Your mission has been fulfilled. So then Lord Ram understood, yes, the time has come. Along with his citizens, he entered into the Sarayu River and departed for the spiritual world. And it is said also that when Lord Ram departed from this world to the spiritual world, he took with him the entire population of his kingdom. So they didn't have to die. They all went back to Godhead. And Lord Ram personally took them back. And even when they were living, they had no old age, they had no disease, no mental suffering, no anxiety, no depression, no bereavement, no lamentation, distress, fear and fatigue. So this is Ram Rajya. And it's all based on complete and utter obedience to the words of Lord Ram and complete devotion to his lotus feet. So if today the cult of devotion to the Supreme Lord spreads everywhere and we have lots and lots of people who become sincere devotees of the Lord. Now we are in such a small minority, an insignificant minority, atomic minority. But if tomorrow we have large portions of the world who surrender to the Lord like this, then actually Lord, that Ram Rajya can manifest here. Prabhupada is mentioning this here in the purport. So it's a good occasion these few days leading up to Ram Navami for us to meditate on Lord Ram's glories 
and his beautiful reign and how wonderful it must have been in his reign. Hmm? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Shri Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman Ki Jai. Jai.